and you brought it back over, and you just kind of took it, and there was no leading from the platform, and I kind of thought, well, kind of nice, but I kind of felt rushed, and not focused, and different things that we do with it, but you know, sometimes I wonder, do we really understand what this means? Our society, the more and more our society is drifting away from God, the more and more our society is drifting away where children aren't raised in any type of church, they're not raised in any type of religion, or any connection with God, if they came in, would they really get what we do and why we're doing it? Do we sometimes get what we do and why we're doing it? So this morning I want to talk about revealing communion. What does it really mean? A.T. Pearson said, The table of the Lord is the link between the cross and the crown. The link, that a bridge, something that connects us between the cross and that Jesus died on, and the crown that one day we all inherit when we are go to reach our eternal reward, between our salvation and our reward. It serves as a memorial. Just like, you know, and I know there's a lot of, uh, of, of anguish in our society today over memorials. I like memorials. I like what they stand for. I, not always what they stand for, but what they, what they speak to us. Because memorials are something that go all the way back into the Old Testament, almost the beginning of time, where God's people would set up stones. They would pile stones upon each other in different places to remind them of the work that God had done in those places. Now we tend to do those things historically to remind us of of, of what we've been blessed with and what we've been brought to, or to remind us of things that maybe we don't want to repeat You know, I think of the Washington Monument in in D.C. and that big obelisk, and it reminds us of the Revolutionary War, and it reminds us of the price that was paid for us to be free. I think of the rock in Plymouth, Massachusetts. It's really not much bigger than this table up here. Sometimes when people think of Plymouth Rock, they think it must be this gigantic boulder. No, it's about the size of this table. But it's there, stamped with the date that reminds us of the day that the pilgrims stepped off the Mayflower into this new land. And how they became thankful for this new place that God brought that God had brought them to. So this table reminds us of Christ, of the sacrifice that He made, of what it all means. In 1 Corinthians eleven, seventeen to thirty three, if you have your Bibles turned there, it says this now in giving these instructions, Paul's writing, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you came together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that these who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you, for I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or die. That's the actual word there. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Well, let me throw you a little bit of background. It's a lot of, it's a lot of words right there. But let me throw you a little bit of background. The Corinthians were a first-generation church. They were the first of, of their people, their peers in their community. They, they were from a very pagan, a very godless society. 
They were, there were other temples and other forms of worship, other gods all around them. You know, one of the interesting things, if we look into Corinthian society, it's not a whole lot of different than, than our modern societies today. Our temples are just different. We still have temples that people go and they participate and worship to idolatry. It just takes on different formats. Their temples would exist, and the way that they participated in the worship of other gods was through sexual immorality, was through drunkenness, was through orgies, was through gambling, games of fortune and chance and luck. All of those things were things that were done in the society of the temples of various gods that they would go to worship, and the way that you worship them was by indulging in those things. And, you know, some people might say, well, you know, it really was just indulging their own flesh and indulging their own desires and their own wants. Today we might not have the name of a god on the outside of those buildings, but we still have all those places for drunkenness and orgies and sexual immorality and gambling. Those things all still exist today, don't they? They're all out there. So when these new Christians came, it wasn't like the Jewish people. The Jewish people had a, a connection with God, with the living God, for many, many years. And, and Christ came through the Jewish people. And the one thing that they understood was the Passover, which was a celebration. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But it was a celebration of the blood of the Lamb that caused the angel of death to pass over them. And so they had this reverence. They took this Passover all the time. So when they became Christians and they began instituting what Jesus had taught them, they had that background of the Passover. So it was a lot different. There was a lot more reverence coming into the Lord's table because they had a connection with God for many years, even though it wasn't through Christ, but now it was. But these Corinthians, that wasn't the, play, that wasn't the thing. So they get together, and communion was often taken in homes. It was taken in home groups. They had life groups way back then. They actually would get together in homes and they would celebrate and they would have a meal, but they would come and they would be more focused on eating or their position at the table when they were eating. Some of them would come and they would actually get drunk during the meal and Paul's like going, hold it. This is not what this is all about. And he wanted them to come to have an idea that there's a reverence that needs to be brought into this because what would take place is there would often be people trying to position themselves with more power than other people, divisions amongst the group, and, and sinful acts going on. He said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Do you not understand what this all represents? What this is all about? And if you partake of this table in an unworthy manner, if you come to this table and your life isn't in the right place with God and you're partaking of it, he said, literally said, there are people out there, you're weak, you're sick, you're even dying because you're partaking unworthy. Wow, I wish we'd take, pay attention to that one these days, eh? That really giving me some eyebrows. He's <laughs> like going, yeah. Well, let's talk about a few of these things that this table symbolizes. The first, it's a table of relationship. Say that. A table of relationship. Relationship with Christ and relationship with the body of Christ, which is what? The church. It's a table of relationship. It's a place where we come and we connect in unity with Jesus. Where we come and we connect with the Almighty God. We know that the bread symbolizes his body and the cup symbolizes his blood. We do not believe that it becomes the, bo the body and the blood of Christ, but we believe that it's symbolic of that body and blood. And I'm going to talk about the, that in a minute. But 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17 says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Now, let me tell you something. If you lived in the day of the Old Testament and you brought a sacrifice to the temple to be sacrificed to God for your sins, whether it was a sin offering or a praise offering or, or an atonement of some form, the one thing that would happen is after that, that offering was made, you were expected to take the meat from that offering. You would share a portion of that meat with the priest. That's how the priest ate. And you would take the remainder of that meat and you and your family would then go and you would sit down and you would eat a meal together. And you would die together. There's a reason for that. Because God wanted his people to understand. If you're going to bring this innocent animal and you're going to sacrifice this, sacrifice this animal, in order for you to have a part in that animal's paying a price 
or covering over your wrongdoing, you need to eat that animal. You need to take it in so you can become one with it. Because what happens when we eat? The food comes into our body. Our body breaks down that food into our systems. It gains nutrition and nutrients from it. We become one. We're partaking of the sacrifice. So when Jesus, obviously we're not going to go and take the body of Jesus physically every time throughout thousands of years. But the body of Jesus, Jesus gave us this example before he became the sacrifice. That when we come together and when we come and we take the bread and we take the cup, he said, you are taking my body, you are drinking my blood, you are partaking of that. Therefore, you are becoming one with me, united with me in that action. You're becoming one with my sacrifice. So every time we partake of this communion, we're saying, Lord, I'm becoming one with you. I am taking you into me so you can spiritually bring that strength into my spirit man and give me that strength and that nourishment from that so we can be one together. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture that I think we need to take note of and the reality and the importance of that. Now, what about the body of Christ? Because we can take Christ in in that way, but we're also doing it together. So as we partake together as the body, we are saying we are one in Christ. You know, Jesus never designed you to be an island unto yourself. It is so important. You heard me talk about it last week. I talked about it actually quite a bit for the past few weeks. But let me just say it again. You were not designed to be an island unto yourself in your salvation. You were designed to be a part of the body of Christ. And when we come together and we partake of this meal together, the bread, the body of Christ, the blood, the the juice, the blood of Christ, we are together becoming one in him. It binds us together. It brings us together as one. And it is so important that we realize That we are not an island unto ourselves, but that we are one in him. So we build relationship with one another by partaking of that together. The third thing that we see in this picture of the table as as the table of relationship is that it's covenanting with Christ and the Father. Now, in the Old Testament, if you were to to make a contract with somebody, you would seal that contract by having a meal. You've heard me say that before. It's an important picture in the Word of God. It's important for us to take note of. You know why weddings have reception meals afterwards? It really goes all the way back to that time of covenanting. Because when you're getting married, you're entering into a contract with someone. You're making a covenant relationship with another person to be one. And then you go and you have a meal together and you're breaking bread. It's as old as as history. It's as old going all the way back to, to these old traditions going way, way, way back. Because it's a sign of that contract. It's a sign of that covenant. How many of you realize God wants a covenant relationship with you? He didn't save you just so you could kind of zip in and zip out of church. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to be in contract with him. What does a contract do? Contracts, covenants, they have expectations, don't they? There's promises and responsibilities. And when you enter into a contract, there's a commitment of us receiving something and a commitment of us bringing something. Jesus has already brought himself, his body, his blood. And when we come and we partake of that body and that blood, we are coming and saying, we bring ourselves, our hearts, our lives back to you and we surrender them to you. So this table of relationship has this depth of meaning because Christ wants us to remember. It's so easy when we think that Jesus died 2,000 years ago. It's so easy to miss the mark. It's so easy when we get saved. How many have been saved for more than 10 or 15 years? You know, when you've been giving your heart to Jesus and you've been serving Jesus for a long time, sometimes we get really comfortable. We get really comfortable with our walk with God. But he doesn't want us to get comfortable. So every time we come and we partake of this, it's reminding us to keep it fresh. What happens if you keep your relationship comfortable with your spouse? It begins to break down, doesn't it? What happens when you begin to to ignore that coming together and breaking bread with your spouse and uniting together and becoming one? All of a sudden, your relationship will begin breaking down as well. The same way with Jesus, we have to come together. We have to unite with him. We have to be one with him. We have to remind ourselves of that covenant with him so we keep that relationship with God fresh and real. 
The second thing it is, it's a table of redemption. A table, say that, a table of redemption. Okay, now everybody say it. A table of redemption. We are reminded every time we partake of communion of the price Jesus paid to forgive us of our sins. You know, it wasn't some small thing he did, was it? And the world kind of laughs. The world doesn't understand anymore because as the world goes further and further away from God and Christ, they don't understand. God himself sent his son to become flesh, to walk on this earth so he could die to pay the price for our sins. It's a table of redemption. A table where a price was paid, a life was given, blood was shed, so we could have eternal life. So the prices could be paid for our eternalness, for our salvation. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Luke 22, verses 15 to 20 says, Then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer, this is Jesus speaking, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed. For you. The Passover. Going back in Israel's history to the time that they were in bondage in Egypt, that they were held captives, slaves in another land for over 400 years. They grew from a large family to a nation of millions. But they were held in slavery by the Egyptians. The Bible refers to that time of their bondage in Egypt as a, as a, a picture of what our lives are like when we are in bondage to sin before we find Jesus Christ. We're dying in sin. We're bound by sin. We're never free. You heard him say the thing. I had I come and I slept and then I was free. We were never free to just follow after God. Free to serve Him. And as they were in that place, when God came and said to deliver Moses so that they could be delivered out of the land of Egypt, he had to bring plagues upon the Egyptians to try and get Pharaoh to say, I'll let these people go. And every time Pharaoh's heart was hardened, every plague that happened, he'd say, they can go. And then he'd harden his heart and say, no, they can't go. And this happened nine times until the tenth plague came. And that plague that was coming was the angel of death. It was death himself that was going to walk through the city streets of Egypt through all the land and take the life of the firstborn child in every household. But God protected his people. He said, you who serve me, you Jews who know me, in order to be saved, you must do this. You must take a lamb that has no spot, that has no blemish in it, that is perfect, and you must kill that innocent lamb and you must take its blood and you must paint it over the, the, the threshold or the, the doorpost of your homes. That when the angel of death moves through the streets of the city, it will not see the sin inside. But it will see that blood of that innocent lamb and it will pass over you and you will have life for you and your family. Otherwise, the firstborn of every home would die. <laughs> Likewise, Jesus said, I am that lamb. He came to become that Passover lamb for you and I. And every time we take up this table, we're reminded that if we have come to him, we were lost in sin. We were bound by sin. We have a sinful nature. All men are born into sin. There's none righteous. No, not one, we're told in the book of Romans. We've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. But God loved us so much. That he sent his only, his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And it is because we have applied the blood of the lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb of God. We've applied it to our lives. So one day when death comes for us, it might physically take us until the day of Jesus' return. But when it comes for us, Spiritually, it cannot put a claim on us because the blood of the Lamb has covered our hearts and washed away our sins. That's 
what this table reminds us of. The great sacrifice Jesus paid with such great love. I just ask, don't we need to bring our love back to him? In redemption, something that many people have forgotten, but in redemption there is also a component of healing. Because God knows that these bodies struggle and suffer in this sinful world. And there's a component that happens. Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5 speaks of it. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions or our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. You see... When Jesus went to the cross, he also took our sickness and he nailed it to that tree. That we could come to him and that same blood that renews our spirit and gives us eternal life, that same blood has the power that when we pray in faith and come to him, has the power to bring healing into our bodies. And when we come to the communion table, I want to always remind people, when you come to that table, if you come with sickness in your body, you can come with an expectation that the blood of the lamb also has the power to heal. It's to remind the people of God through our lives from the point that we're saved to the point that we go home to be with Jesus to the point that we gain our crown that there is still healing in this life. That he still brings that medicine through his own blood to us. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. Make sure you're out there tonight. (laughs) The the Razor game, it's not for three more hours. Unless you're boycotting. Third thing, it's a table of renewal. It's a table of renewal. You know, this table was meant for us to come and to judge ourselves. Think about that. We're not supposed to judge one another, but the Bible does call us to examine our own lives. To look at our own lives and ask ourselves, how does my life line up with Christ? Well, if you go back to that opening scripture, I'd like to go back to starting with verse 27. Paul was right, he says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Pretty powerful statement right there. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. In other words, this table is meant to be celebrated on a regular basis so we can stop and look at our own lives and say, how am I living before God? Am I following the lifestyle that God wants me to live? Am I obeying His Word? Am I pursuing holiness? Am I pursuing His righteousness in my life? Or am I doing my own thing and living my own way? Am I in right relationship with God? The other thing that brings out is, am I in right relationship with my fellow man? Am I angry at someone? Am I bitter? Do I wish someone would die? Do I have anger or unforgiveness towards another person, whether that's in my family or the body of Christ or somebody that I work with. Because just as much as looking at our relationship with God, He wants us to make sure our relationship with the body is in good condition. So much that He says, if you take up this table and your relationship with God is not right and your relationship with man is not right, then you're eating of it in an unworthy manner and you're in danger of actually bringing physical harm to yourself. I'd like to sink in for a second. I've watched many a person avoid the table when it comes by. They don't partake of it because they don't feel worthy. 
but they totally missed the point of what we're being taught in this passage of Scripture. You see, it's a table of renewal. He wanted us to come and partake of this table until he comes back, until he returns for his church, until that day of salvation, that can, the, the fulfillment of our salvation is reached. We've already talked about the return of Christ a lot this past last month. But what he wants us to do in the meantime is make sure that we are continuously coming and examining our lives to make sure that they are in right communion with God and our fellow man. Because he knows that we're human. And he knows that we will need to come back and revisit that memorial place to remind ourselves that we need to make sure that we're walking in that right relationship. It was his way. Of saying, look at your lives and keep it in the right place. Because it's so easy in this world to get pulled aside and to get pulled away and to get caught up in the cares of this world. You know one in four people give their lives to Jesus. Only one in four really truly serve him. That's what Jesus taught us in the parable of the different soils. Others get caught up by, by the cares of life, by the desire for riches, by the wants of the things of this world. Only one in four really let that seed take root in their life. But those one in four, even then we can find ourselves getting beat up by the cares of life, getting caught up with the things we want to see because we can see them in this physical world. And he wants to bring us back and renew our faith in him. To renew our relationship with him. To make sure that we're reunited and we're in that place where we should be. So we don't examine ourselves to not partake. We examine ourselves to make ourselves right before Christ. You know, the Catholics have something right in this sense. Before they're allowed to take communion in their service, they have to go see the priest on what? The Friday night or the Saturday night before the service? They have to go see the priest. They have to confess their sins. And they have to be absolved of those sins by the priest. Now... I believe that we go to Jesus and Jesus alone. He is our mediator. We don't need a man in between us. But there's something in that practice that speaks to us truth from God's word. Because before they can partake of their communion table, they have to first go and make things right with God through their priest. Well, Jesus is our high priest, so all we have to do is get in line, get in the place with God, with Jesus Christ, and say, God... I need to make things right with you. You know, and the priest turns around and tells them, don't keep doing this. He doesn't just absolve them and say, okay, go on and keep doing it. He tells them to stop. Our staple that when Jesus found the woman caught in adultery, he said, go and sin no more. He doesn't say, keep sinning. He says, okay, you've come to me, you've made it right now, go and sin no more. And it's a place that when we come to partake of it, to connect with Jesus, to connect with the body of Christ, that we look inside and say, is there something off in my life that I need to get right? Is there some sin in my life? We all know what those sins are. Some of us live in sin all the time, and we just get comfortable with it. Stop it. Stop it. But realize that this table is there so we can make things right with Him because God loves us that much. Jesus made a way for us to renew relationship with him on a regular basis. So that covenant is renewed. So we're partaking of that sacrifice into our own spirit man all the time. So every time we partake of this table, we're getting things right with him and making sure things are right with each other. Because you know what? You don't have a right to be mad at your brother or sister in Christ. You don't have a right to be mad at another person, at someone else. Maybe it's a former spouse, maybe it's a child, maybe it's um, someone at work who hurt you or a former employer. You don't have the right to keep that anger in your heart. Jesus forgave you, you need to forgive them. And he wants us to remember that just as we've been forgiven, just as he paid that price for us, we need to forgive others as well and let that forgiveness flow through our lives. Why? Because if we don't let that forgiveness flow, it's going to hinder our relationship with him. It's a table of relationship. It's a table of redemption. And it's a table of renewal. All meant for us as the body of Christ on a regular basis to come together as his family, as his church, and partake of that we can stay in that right place because this connects us from our day of salvation 
until the day until he comes. Because isn't that what we're supposed to take until? I love the old communion tables that have the until he comes across the front. Because that's why we take this. We take it until he comes back. When he comes back, we won't need to do this anymore. We're going to be in heaven perfected, living eternally. Amen? Amen. Praise God. That is our hope. That's what we're looking for. Yes. If you're not looking for that, <laughs> that's why we serve him. But until that time comes, this is what helps us to stay connected with him. To stay in that place of renewal. Would you buy your hands with me? I should have you kind of what was coming to serve the communion this morning. Thank you, Jesus. As we close out our service this morning, we're going to close by partaking of communion today. I waited until the end this morning because I wanted us to just hear those words. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves what it's all about. And so, as they're coming to serve 